So now let's talk about pain neurobiology. This is where we're going to get into some of the more complex science, I guess, behind it. And we're going to try to make this as simplified as we can, but it, you can't really simplify a complex topic perfectly. Um, and it's important if we're going to really help patients with pain, we need to have a really deep understanding of the neurobiology and everything that goes into their pain experience. So you can be able to on the fly just start throwing out metaphors and stories and different things because you have such a deep knowledge of what's going on in their body that you can just kind of meld and create and be uh, creative with that knowledge base. So it really is something that you need to dig into. You really need to go deeper than what we probably are going to go into here, but we're going to give you a really solid base of neurobiology that should at least give you a good framework and we're going to give you readings and different things that you can do to kind of further your knowledge base on that. And guess what? Science is moving forward and we're learning more about pain every day. So we'll probably, as years go on, the reading list is only going to get higher. So we need to be keeping up with it. So Patrick Wall has a very helpful kind of framework to think about tissue injury. And I get this from Jason Silverman. He's the one that first really introduced me to it. But The Science of Suffering, his book on pain is a wonderful book that I'd highly recommend you read. It's a pretty decent, uh, doesn't take too long to read and a lot of great pearls and nuggets in that book. But he talks about the three stages of pain of withdrawal from a tissue injury where you're pulling your hand off the burner or, or, or moving your body out of harm's way. Then there's protection. And I think this is a really important phase of this to think about. And protection is so many things. Homeostatic responses of immune system changes going into pro-inflammatory states of an endocrine system raising protection in an arousal state of a neural system sensitizing around that tissue injury of a motor system developing protective motor patterns and protection of a body part that is helpful in the acute stage often, oftenly and what we would call adaptive because it's what we need to happen to protect our body from further damage. It's when our body gets stuck in protection that it's where things go awry, where our, our, our endocrine system isn't meant to be in arousal states chronically. Our nervous system shouldn't be sensitive chronically. Our immune system shouldn't be driven up to pro-inflammatory states chronically. Um, that's maybe a little reductionist views of things, but it, that's what happens to people. And when these systems stay in protect mode chronically, 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 watch some of the videos of Peter O'Sullivan with some of the people he sees on YouTube with persistent back pain and all the protection they have going on of how they move differently, how they can't stop tensing their bodies because they've got information on board and behaviors on board taught to them often by PTs, unfortunately, of how they need to protect and fear their back versus becoming confident and relaxed with the back. Um, I'd argue that this is where the vast majority of our patients are stuck protecting their body part. And sometimes this protection may be validated. I mean, an extremely degenerative, uh, nasty arthritic knee, there might be need to be protective behaviors and maybe we can change it and help it improve. But um, then sometimes, you know, it's okay to get a knee replacement. I think too often we take the, the extreme approach of nobody should get surgery. Well, I'd say there's probably times where surgery is indicated. Now, does it get overutilized, especially here in the United States? Absolutely. It's a huge money-making enterprise and best practice. It doesn't always catch up with surgical procedures being developed that cost thousands upon hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. Um, so we have to recognize that there's some limitations. But regardless, this is a helpful framework to think about it. We're really trying to move patients to resolution. We're trying to move them to where their homeostatic systems start de you know, calming back down, desensitizing, getting back in a more regulated state. Um, again, sometimes there's genetic things and, and things that have happened in people's lives where maybe they're never going to get perfectly where things are back to a nice homeostatic baseline of uh, comfortable and cool. But gosh, if we can plug people, people into understanding this, I think it's a helpful way to kind of move them into a positive direction. I use protection all the time with patients and discuss how their body's stuck in protection. I think it's a helpful concept for people because then they can see why tensing, um, why their nervous system saying so sensitive and sore isn't helpful after tissues have healed. But that's a tough explanation to have and we'll discuss that more when we get into pain neuroscience education. But really these homeostatic systems have really a baseline level of functions that they need to accomplish. They need a sampling or monitoring system which is all these nociceptive and interoceptive, extraoceptive apparatuses that are bringing in extraoceptive and interoceptive information from our body and environment to, to give us the information to make some judgments on. The control center needs to be there to gather that information and pull it all up into a control center, that being your brain. 
and output or effector system, which is your nervous system, your endocrine system, your immune system, your motor system, all these different systems um, that make have an output based on what that uh, control center says. And then a feedback system that should say, hey, threat's been dealt with, chill out, calm back down. Um, that's where sometimes that we'll talk about when these systems get dysregulated, where that feedback system is never getting the all clear. It's never seeing that the stressors aren't present or people live lives where they're never out of stress. They're never out of danger because they either have psychological issues, psychosocial issues, other issues that might be driving their system up into a hyperprotective state and not allowing it to come back down. This is a great graph from a Chapman article that I believe we've shared in majority of our classes and with you guys um, that really kind of looks at how your immune system, your endocrine system, and your neurologic system all kind of work in concert with each other electrochemically. So we like to learn these systems in very categorical terms to better understand them. But you know what? They don't work that way. They work very correlated and they depend on each other to modulate each other's function. Um, so we need to learn how do they correlate. So becoming a neuroimmunoendocrinologist or understanding it from that perspective can be really helpful. Especially when we see some of these persistent pain states, uh, your chronic fatigue syndromes where there's endocrine system dysfunction along with fibro patients who have that endocrine dysfunction, but also the fibro patients who have this pro-inflammatory state that's present in their body, or these folks who have allodynia and hyperalgesia um, with sensitized nervous systems. Can we kind of make sense of how all these body systems may likely work together to produce these phenomenon um, that kind of can maybe be more diagnosed or labeled by an endocrinologist, an immunologist, or a neurologist, but maybe we shouldn't be cordoning them off the way that we do. The other thing to recognize is that when two nerves talk to each other, there's a lot of immune system. There's glial cells, oligodendrocytes, and other things that really are in there discussing, microglia is another one, that are kind of modulating the connectivity of two nerves. So they decide how well these nerves talk to each other or how, nerves, how well these nerves stay apart. Um, and we've really disregarded those. We used to think that these glial cells, which are 80 or so percent of the nerves in our, our nervous system, um, were just glue, that they were just useless cells, but they have a very important function of modulating sensitivity and connectivity of our nervous system. They're almost like the pruners of the tree that allow certain branches to grow and connect while they prune others away. Um, but it's a very important thing to know because that's how our immune system kind of can influence sensitivity of our nervous system. Maybe that's why when our immune system's going crazy with the flu virus in our body, that gosh, all everything's becoming sensitive. Your hair hurts to touch because you your body's in such a pro-inflammatory, pro-immune state that it's raising your sensitivity up. Maybe it's helpful to feel like crap when you have the flu so you don't go out and try to do things that don't allow your body to prioritize healing and dealing with the disease process that's present in their body. The HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis is very important. Your hypothalamus has the pituitary gland which secretes corticotropal releasing hormone and ACTH that eventually permeates your blood and touches onto the adrenal glands, which are in your kidneys, top of your kidneys, which secretes cortisol, which is kind of a potent corticosteroid naturally occurring in our body um, that eventually when it becomes present in our body should negatively inhibit the uh, hypothalamus from producing more of this stuff. Um, but that's a very important kind of endocrine immune neuro uh, apparatus that we should understand because it really can become dysfunctional. And there's so much research to show that this apparatus becomes highly dysfunctional in persistent pain states. So understanding how these uh, that system kind of works together to produce some of these uh, endocrine chemicals, hormones, and different things in our body can be a helpful understanding. We'll give you some readings to kind of get deeper and dive into that. Um, it's a complex state, but it's a, at least important to know from a base, basic level how these systems work together. This is a graph from a Hannibal study in, I believe, JOSPT or PT journal, but it basically talks about the stress response and how there can be adaptive responses and maladaptive responses, um, along with sensitized, sensitized fear-based memories that can happen. You know, your body in the presence of stress can really imprint memories. You know, it's why I can ask you what you had for breakfast four days ago and you scratch your head, yet I ask you, and maybe more people in the United States, where were you on September 11th of 2001? And that memory and context is seared into your memory banks because in presence of high emotion and high stress, those cortisol chemicals and different things really help your amygdala and your hippocampus wire in those memories into your hippocampus so they're easily recalled because it's probably helpful in life 
to have good memories of when we're under high amounts of distress from sheer survival instincts um, to really under, to know those contexts by heart, to know when we encounter them again, that it's, you know, obviously and hopefully we never encounter another 9-11 again, but maybe a car accident or something when we're in context that maybe in the future we could prevent by taking different invasive maneuvers that maybe that helps us survive a, a similar uh, accident going forward. Um, so again, some of this stuff's very helpful, but when we get this prolonged and excessive HPA axis activation, this cortisol dysfunction happens where we get this immune system issues, but unfortunately when cortisol gets really highly prevalent and dysfunctional uh, modulation in the body, it can really lead to cognitive and emotional limbic system dysfunction where you get depression, uh, hypersensitivity of pain, and it can really, um, again, that stressor doesn't necessarily only need to be physical. It could be psychological, psychosocial, social stressors that really drive these things, a breakup with a loved one, a death of a loved one. How many of us have had patients that have had pain states that really got magnified or even maybe emerged after the death of a loved one or those huge emotional traumas that we unfortunately hear stories of in our clinic. Hopefully we're at least listening to these people to understand that that's the background story that brings them into us. So we might think maybe I don't need to be poking around in tissues as much. Maybe I need to just help them seek grief counseling or different things and along with maybe getting active and reassuring them that they're okay and that they can move and that their body's robust and that we don't need to freak them out by now. Let's, not only are they falling apart emotionally and psychologically, but let's, let's image them and tell them that they're falling apart uh, physically as well, or tell them all these movement faults or terrible things that are going on with them from a physical therapy perspective. That just grinds my gears, unfortunately. Now, the immune system, there's a constant balancing act that's going on in our body of how active or inactive our immune system needs to be. And it's you know, what will happen oftentimes is in the presence of threat or needs for elevation of this pro-inflammatory response, you get, you'll see studies like in fibromyalgia patients where this, this uh, immune system is staying in a hyperactive state, I guess, where there's this pro-inflammatory state where they're showing high cytokine levels in blood uh, measures and different things. But you'll also see these patients who are chronically feeling like they had the flu. Again, when we have an immune system that's active and we get this sickness response, really the sickness response of feeling like crap and not wanting to get out of bed and not moving and doing stuff is a pretty helpful response in the acute stages of it. It's pretty helpful because it helps us not go out and do anything. It lets our body rest and really prioritize fighting the bacteria or virus or tissue injury or whatever it may be that um, is going on in our body that that, that sickness response is helping us prioritize. Um, so again, that sickness response is helpful, but it, again, just like a lot of the responses we see in these homeostatic systems, when it happens chronically and for prolonged time periods, and sometimes driven by stressors that are more than just biologic, um, that this becomes unhelpful, that these people oftentimes feel wiped out, they can't sleep well, they can't uh, wake refreshed, they have all these other issues that don't make sense from a biologic tissue-based standpoint. Um, we'll see people who have prolonged swelling and inflammation. We're going to talk about neurogenic inflammation of how our nerves communicate with our tissues and have a trophic function to them that can cause a body part that even though tissue healing has long since passed, that textbook definition of uh, you know six to eight weeks of tissue healing, three months, I guess it can vary depending on tissue, has long since passed, yet these people are still showing swelling um, and inflammation signs around their tissues. Um, might be also be other systemic or genetic influences, but we can start making sense of those things when we look beyond just biologic tissue healing. Um, spreading pain, when we start seeing disinhibition of uh, sensory receptive fields where all of a sudden what started as a nice L3 dermatoma is spreading into L4 and L5 where now, gosh, it's looking, our heads are getting scratched because what looked like a nice clean dermatomal pattern that we all love to see in the clinic because we know what that is, we can oftentimes target and direct treatments to help those more specifically. Now it's looking all the whole legs becoming involved. Um, disinhibition of sensory and motor uh, homunculi. We'll talk in a great detail when we talk about um, some of the cortical changes that happen with pain, but all of a sudden that representation of a hand in your brain, um, Butler's pin box example is great. Instead of it looking like one hand, it looks like just a smudged together uh, hand that doesn't have the nice fine motor capabilities because really to understand where your body is and to move it well, you need to have a good representation of it in your brain, both from a sensory and motor perspective. But if you think about the patients who we see um, who are in chronic sensitivity and pain, they're often not moving their body part for chronic periods of time, not feeding their sensory and motor homunculi any proprioceptive information to maintain good body maps. Again, we'll talk about this in more detail. 
but our immune system modulates that connectivity. That connectivity um, or, or disconnectivity, I guess you could say to put it in poor English, um, is modulated by an immune system that determines that. And if the problem is, is you know, cells that should be disconnected that give your body a good clear representation of a hand in space become connected where all of a sudden this representation of a hand, a low back, a knee might become dis disinhibited or, or smudged or blurry in the nervous system. The neuroimmune coupling also can happen from what toll-like receptors. And if you read David Butler and Lorimer Mosley's newest book, Explain Pain Supercharged, they speak about toll-like receptors where there's these receptors on cells that can sniff out damage-related uh, molecular patterns, pathology-related uh, molecular patterns, xenobiotic, which is just external chemical molecular patterns, maybe behavioral uh, molecular patterns of when we trigger certain behaviors, maybe there's a molecular pattern of the nervous system behaving a certain way that feeds into that, that behavioral pattern um, and cognitive patterns. Can we have different thought patterns that create different molecular patterns? There are all these neuroimmune endocrine thoughts or nervous system uh, signals in our brain that are likely going to influence immune endocrine system shifts that maybe our nervous system can recognize and represent that maybe again, where you can just think about certain things and trigger immune system or autonomic responses where you can put somebody who's had a very traumatic situation back into it. Not that we should ever do that as in physical therapy um, where they can start triggering some of the anxiety and physiological responses just through thoughts. But let's look at it um, in a study here in a second that talks about how our thoughts, oops, I went in the wrong direction here, but um, that looks at these studies where can we modulate immune system activity and inflammatory responses based on just thoughts? So these folks were given imagery tasks. These are folks, I believe, who had complex regional pain syndrome. And these both studies were by uh, Mosley, where they, they looked at giving these folks a visualization uh, motor imagery task um, and then measured pain and swelling. And they found in these studies that you can see here that, and I'm not going to get into the details of all that stuff, but finger circumference and pain actually having physiologic changes with cognitive you know, imagery tasks um, makes us see that there is some sort of connectivity. Now, we don't know a lot of it's speculative, but man, it sure starts making sense that that could be. So it'll be interesting to see where science goes with this to see how much can our cognitions, but we see that again, a scary movie or, or, or different things that thoughts or, or fears or anxieties or cognitive patterns in our brain can rep or that can materialize into real physiologic responses in our body. Uh, I just think science has to kind of hash through and figure that how that all correlates. Um, but then again, how do these cognitive patterns around what we conceive to be going on in our back, the jelly donut story of jelly oozing out of a disc that's, that's causing your disc to herniate every time you bend over. Some of these negative maladaptive fear generating uh, conceptions that we give patients around their pain, could that influence pain states and immune system reactivity and endocrine system reactivity? I would think so that the science that I've read thus far makes sure makes a lot of sense. I'm open to being wrong with that if science proves us otherwise, um, but man, it sure does make sense when, it, when we look at some of the responses in, in immune system dysfunction, endocrine system dysfunction, sleep dysfunction, all these other things that go on with patients that don't make sense if we just look at it from a tissue-based perspective. But human beings are unique, and Robert Sapolsky talks about human beings in his book, uh, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. And the basic premise of this book is zebras don't get ulcers or these stress-related issues in our tummy um, often because they don't carry stress chronically like humans do. They can get nearly gobbled up at the watering hole from a crocodile, and then 10 minutes later, it's like nothing happened. Life is hunky-dory, their systems are back calmed down, and they're having the time of their lives. Where humans are the unique uh, species where we create and carry chronic stressors over and over again. We have mortgage payments, uh, identities being threatened by loss of ability to function as a husband, as a wife, as a worker, as a colleague. Um, these thoughts of people telling you it's all in your head, these conceptions of degenerative disc disease or crumbling discs or all these horrible thoughts around their pain or the, the job that they hate is going on. But all these stressors and all these humans that we see have unique stressors that we need to understand what's going on in their life and maybe put these dots together if they're showing these signs of much more than just nociceptive dominant pain patterns that we should start plugging these things into people. But these stressors, can they generate a lot of the same endocrine, neuro and immune system sensitivity responses? Maybe not to the degree of a acute tissue injury, but we're starting to see research that shows a lot of these psychosocial factors are quite predictive of pain states and that we should be definitely keeping these in mind when we think about people. 
one way that I like to, to look at patients is instead of just looking at them through their biologic loads, that maybe we think about them through their biopsychosocial loads, but what are their psychological loads and social loads that are going on in, within their life? Um, and understanding that allostasis is to respond to these loads, whether it is biologic, psychologic, social, or anything in between, where we, it's going to seek to raise sensitivity to that stressor and then seek allostatic processes as far as processes within these homeostatic systems to bring them ourselves back down to baseline um, and that's going on constantly with things and ideally these stressors don't hang around long term you know and, and can somebody have a biologic stressor that's chronic and repetitive and we see this maybe in workplaces with repetitive stress and injuries and different things where maybe there is a influence of repetitive biologic load but man we've done a pretty good job i think of conceptualizing biologic loads we suck quite frankly, of understanding psychosocial loads that are on our patients. We do some things, but I think we can do much better, and that's what we're going to help you guys do. Um, to, to really look at allostasis, there's, there's um, this fast response and slow response of this fast response of mobilizing all this activity to, to deal with these threats. And then once these feedback systems recognize threats been managed, this nice allostatic uh, uh, process with these feedback mechanisms and its HPA axes and sympathetic adrenal medullary uh, cap, uh, processes activating to downmodulate some of their activity to bring things back down to a smooth homeostatic state. That's what should happen when stressors hit us. We should, things should fast response and then recover back down to baseline. How many patients do we see that don't have that recovery to baseline? Um, and what will happen is a term called, and Bruce McEwen and others are, are amazing at kind of conceptualizing this, but this allostatic overload where there's just this chronic massive stressor in life that's really just giving this system a bombardment of stress that's not even giving it a chance to even think about coming down um, but there's also this inability of the system to respond to modest stress or maybe there's genetic influences or there's other things surrounding this person's life um, that can really lower their coping abilities maybe it's comorbid health genetics other things that are going on other loads in their life that just don't allow this current load that they're undergoing them to adapt to it and it raises their sensitivity state. Or maybe the system is just not hearing the all clear. There's just no reason your body's not getting any messages that that stressor's leaving. Maybe, um, you know, there's just, it's either staying chronically long-term where your body's, you know, chronically living in the haunted house, which we'll talk about with patients, um, where it's just always in chronic arousal stress mode where it's and your body's constantly perceiving these stressors that are existing in your life that there's no reason for it to hear all clear because you're always chronically in these relationship stresses, physical stresses, psychosocial stresses that might drive the system to remain sensitive. So hopefully we can help connect the dots for our patients on that. Now this is a graph that I take from the Aches and Pains book from Lewis Gifford, a great three book series that I highly recommend you guys get your hands on. It is probably the, one of the most influential books that I've read to better encapsulate this stuff into my practice. Um, and it's always good to get this stuff from multiple pers perspectives, not just modern pain cares or Jared Hall's or Greg Layman's, but I'll just get as many of these perspectives as possible to best learn this stuff. But it, it just goes into how this chronic pain and stress can kind of correlate with each other, where this ongoing pain, uncertainty, unpredictability, this negative emotions and anger that often accompanies this, which causes unresolved mental stress, this dysregulation of the stress response, that kind of homeostatic mechanism that we talked about, um, we also have this environmental or genetic influences on the stress system, but we also have past traumas that can influence this as well. Um, how many patients can we see often that have history of physical abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse, unfortunately, that we see often can influence their pain state. Um, I had a patient recently who uh, came to see me with CRPS and just a, a pretty nasty pain state who after we talked about past experiences and different things influencing how sensitive our nervous system can become over time, um, you know, relayed to me that her stepfather attempted to drown her twice in a bathtub um, as she's grown up as a kiddo. So imagine your life when you're, when you're supposed to be in the most safe place on earth with mom and dad is a life-threatening place for you. How do you navigate the world when, when you're supposed to be the safest, you're a life-threatening danger? So it just makes sense to me as we learn that your system never can calm down, even at home, that maybe that's why her state, her system wired itself so sensitively and is having these significant pain states. I mean, obviously that's not my job to talk to her about that. When I hear those bits of information, that's when I start relying, relying on my psychology, psychiatry colleagues, and thankfully um, she was getting help for that at that time. But 
um, man, we need to at least search to hear if there's those things and help people connect the dots and seek a more multidisciplinary approach to help the whole person, not just their biology, um, because their biology is going to be greatly influenced by that type of experience. Um, but the, the big thing we also need to know is adverse effects on a tissue. So immunosuppression doesn't help our healing response happen the way it should. Uh, we sometimes lose control of inflammation where it goes hypersensitive, hyperinflammatory processes. We get this overall poor health and healing. Tissues become vulnerable. We'll talk about this vulnerable organism model where we just don't have much room to take any more loads on because our life right now is just full of jacked up high levels of stress uh, maybe a combination of biopsychosocial stressors that just don't put us in a situation where we're going to be able to to tolerate that so again here's your normal recovery ideally that's where all our patients hang out and then here's our sensitive recovery and sometimes this can help to draw this for a patient of after this tissue stressor uh you know emotional stressor whatever it may be that triggered the pain for this life ideally our systems calm down after that but you know, we do know that there's a lot of people that that sensitivity remains reg highly elevated after these type of injuries or stressors. Um, and we can maybe plug into what might be going on in their life that's not letting their, their systems or their sensitivity, their homeostatic, homeostatic systems down modulate and bring things back down to a more baseline state. Uh, the coping graph is another helpful graph that I think can be uh, helpful. On the left side, that's this capacity to cope. How much uh, resources do we have physiologically built into our system that can help us take on a lot of these stressors. And you can see on the left side of the graph, there's a lot of space underneath that curve where there's a lot we can probably handle and tolerate. That's probably the more well slept, the happy patient who's not depressed, the patient who's got healthy relationships in their social and uh, lives, the, the patient that may be active and comorbidly health, healthy, the patient who has good genetics on their side. There's a lot of things that can shift us there. Um, but also, you know, this graph shows along that curve, the alarm, the adaption and exhaustion stages of stress, which is the three stages of stress that happen. And that's based on the works of Hans Selye, uh, uh, pretty much the father of stress research, um, who kind of developed these stages. But again, when these chronic stressors or acute stressors are there, we often have good resources present to deal with them. When they come, become chronic, it really taps our resources away. Um, it can start affecting a lot of our health and then all of a sudden, man, it doesn't take us much to be able to really flare our pain or it doesn't even take, you know, a big biological or maybe it's just stressors at work or stress in, le in life, weather changes, simple things that should be innocuous changes in our stress systems can generate a pain experience because that organism has tapped itself down. Gifford would call that person a vulnerable organism, uh, which I think is a great way to think of these folks that they just don't have uh, physiologic capabilities and coping capabilities to tolerate much. And they're also the people on the left side of the graph who will say, I used to be able to play with my kids. I used to be able to tolerate a full workday. I used to be able to do all these things. But now after my pain state, I can barely walk to the mailbox. I can barely, you know, even, you know, accompany my kids to their soccer game, let alone participate with them like I used to. Um, so you can start drawing these connections to what their life experiences have been and start talking to people. Here's what you used to be. Here's what you could do. And this sensitive recovery is what's gotten you there. Um, and we'll talk about it in pain neuroscience education of how we can connect those dots with people.